All right, in this clinical review, we're going to walk through the generational evolution of cephalomedullary nailing. Our focus is going to be on the very clear problem-driven design changes we've seen from that original gamma nail all the way to the systems we're using today. The goal here is to really understand the biomechanical and clinical thinking behind the implants we choose. So here's our roadmap. It's pretty straightforward. We'll kick things off with the limitations of extramedullary fixation, why we needed something new. Then we'll march through the first, second, and third generations of nail design, and we'll wrap it all up by pulling together the key principles that have really guided this whole evolution. You know, to really appreciate the intramedullary nail, we first have to understand the problems it was designed to fix. And that story starts with the clinical headaches we were all having with extramedullary devices like the sliding hip screw. First things first, let's get on the same page with our core definition. A cephalomedullary nail, or CMN, is, at its heart, an intramedullary load-sharing device. That cephalic component, whether it's a screw or a blade, gets its purchase in the femoral head, which is what makes it so perfect for those unstable proximal femur fractures. Now this slide, this gets to the fundamental biomechanical difference. Look at the DHS on the left. It acts as a load-bearing device, a tension band, because it's so far from the mechanical axis, you get this really long lever arm and consequently incredibly high bending moments. Now, contrast that with the CMN. It's a load sharing device. By placing it right down the canal, you dramatically shorten that lever arm, which means much less stress across both the implant and the fracture itself. And those high bending moments, they translated directly into real clinical problems. Extramedullary plates meant bigger exposures. They absolutely depended on having an intact lateral wall and frankly, they just didn't perform well in unstable fracture patterns or in severely osteoporotic bone. These limitations created a clear demand for a mechanically better intramedullary solution. And not demand led us straight to the first generation of CMNs. This was a true paradigm shift, moving the implant from the side of the bone right into the medullary canal. The pioneer here was the classic gamma nail. Think of it, short, incredibly stiff, made of stainless steel. It had this very large proximal diameter and featured a single big lag screw to get fixation into the femoral head, usually with a fixed valgus angle built right in. So the crucial point is this. The concept was absolutely revolutionary. By moving the hardware inside the bone, it totally changed the mechanical environment. It turned a load-bearing construct into a load-sharing one, which for the first time allowed for a controlled dynamic impaction right at the fracture site. But this brilliant innovation brought its own set of problems. That short, stiff design, it created a massive stress riser right at the tip of the nail, and we saw a shockingly high rate of iatrogenic shaft fractures. Its huge diameter also caused fractures at the entry point, and we were still dealing with issues like varismal reduction and screw cutout. So these first-gen complications, especially the mechanical failures, were the direct catalyst for the design changes that defined the second generation. And the number one target was improving stability. This is where implants like the proximal femoral nail, the PFN, came in. The key innovation, the big idea, was adding a second, smaller anti-rotation screw just superior to the main lag screw. The whole point was to get explicit control over the rotation of the head neck fragment, which was a huge problem in unstable patterns. And these nails were now being made of more elastic titanium and had smaller proximal diameters. However, in solving the rotation problem, designers accidentally created a new and pretty notorious failure mode, the Z effect. You see, because the two screws weren't connected, they could actually migrate in opposite directions when put under a cyclical load. So let's visualize this. This is the ideal post-operative picture. You've got your lag screw and your anti-rotation screw, both parallel, both well-positioned in the femoral head. This gives you both axial and rotational stability. Looks great. But here's what could happen. With cyclical loading, especially if you had a suboptimal reduction or poor bone quality, the superior screw starts backing out laterally as the inferior screw dives medially. This migration creates that classic Z pattern on an X-ray, and it means your fixation has failed. So, the challenge of the Z effect, combined with this growing focus on our patients with really poor bone quality, is what spurred the development of the third generation of cephalomedullary nails. Okay, so third generation designs really attacked these issues with two main strategies. The first was to find a better way to get a grip in osteoporotic bone, and that's where the helical blade comes in. 
The second strategy was to just eliminate the Z-effect altogether by mechanically linking the cephalic screws. The helical blade was a really clever piece of engineering. Instead of drilling and removing bone, you impact the blade. This action compacts the spongy, cancellous bone around the implant. In theory, this increases the local bone density, giving you a much more stable implant bone interface, which is absolutely critical in osteoporosis. Now, the inner tan took a different path. It kept the two cephalic screws for rotational control, but, and this is the key, it mechanically linked them together inside the nail. This forces them to act as a single solid unit. It allows for controlled linear compression, but completely eliminates any possibility of the Z-effect. Okay, let's take a step back and really synthesize this 30-year evolution. What are the crucial takeaways for us, for our clinical practice today? This table really distills the whole story down. Generation 1 introduced the intramedullary concept, but gave us peri-implant fractures. Generation 2 improved our rotational control, but introduced the Z-effect. And finally, Generation 3 zeroed in on osteoporotic bone and integrated stability to solve the failures of the past. And if you look at this as a timeline focused on just the cephalic element, which is really the business end of the implant, right? You see this perfect problem-solution arc. We went from a simple lag screw to dual screws for rotation, then to blades for bone quality, and finally to integrated screws for the ultimate combo of stability and control. So the key principle to walk away with is that this evolution wasn't random at all. We see these clear, logical trends. The entry point shifting to the trochanter, the move to titanium alloys, and the step-by-step -step refinement of cephalic fixation. But the main story, the real narrative here, is that complication drives innovation. Every single implant in our trays today is a direct answer to the failures of the one that came before it. And that leaves us with a final question to think about. We've seen how the challenges of peri-implant fracture, rotational instability, and osteoporosis drove three generations of design. So looking ahead, as our patients and their fractures get even more complex, what's the next great clinical problem that's gonna drive the fourth generation of these essential implants?